Hey guys, welcome to another episode on TFB TV. Today we're going to be looking at Australian small arms history in terms of the small arms factory in Lithgow, which is a part of Australia, a small mining town originally, that is about 60 miles outside of Sydney. And you can drive there today and we also have the Lithgow Museum, which I'd highly recommend if you're visiting Australia, you should definitely try to make it out to the Lithgow Museum, if only to see all the stuff that's on display, weird prototypes, all that kinds of stuff there. Um, we'd like to thank Venture Munitions for this episode as well. They help us keep us going and help us get the sorts of video equipment that we need for this kinds of content. So when talking about Australian small arms production history, we have to start with Lithgow. And Lithgow is essentially the epicenter of Australian small arms uh, military production history. So Lithgow gets its start prior to World War One in about 1907. And what's really cool about this earlier part of Lithgow history is that you have this competition for who is going to put machines in the Australian government's premier small arms production facility. And it was a big competition between Pratt & Whitney machines from the United States over British machines that were earlier being used in the time period, specifically for rifling machines as well. After a long and extended period of trials, Pratt & Whitney actually won out, much to the charging of the British machine companies in the United Kingdom at the time. And this was part of sort of Pratt & Whitney's gain of prominence that continued throughout the 1900s in which you see, you know, larger stuff with uh, the aircraft industry as well. So right before we dive into Lithgow's history, I want to sort of recommend, there's a couple volumes out there um, produced by the Lithgow Museum. One is Lithgow's Small Arms Factory and its People, Volume 1 and volume two. You also have another book written by the same author, Tony Griffiths, talking about the Enfield Inch and the Lithgow 303. Um, these are pretty good books. They're hard to get outside of Australia, but they're still available. Anyway, so the factory gets its beginnings around 1907. In 1912, it starts producing Lee Enfield SMLEs. And this goes on to essentially anything that the Commonwealth was producing at the time. And up until, you know, the 1950s and even past the Vietnam era, um, you have production of Lee Enfields, you have production of Bren guns, you have production of all sorts of other stuff that came down the line, um, minor accoutrements and that kind of thing in addition to ammunition. Um, but essentially you have all these Commonwealth weapons produced for the Australian military that would see use in the First World War and then continue into the Second World War. So between the wars and after the wars, you have this rise and fall of the Lithgow factory and that, you know, similar to what you have in the United States, when as soon as the war ended, you have production, you know, decreasingly go down, contracts are over, the war is over, and you have all these factory workers that sort of sprung up to support this gigantic industrial industry during the First World War and in the Second World War, and you have all these factory workers now out of a job, essentially, and now they're pushing elsewhere. So entering the Second World War, we see a lot of more experimentation at Lithgow in regards to small arms designs, and you see a lot of these interesting trials and a lot, number of different experiments that you didn't see as much in the First World War. For example, we have specimens of Bakelite stock Lee Enfields. We have different versions of submachine gun manufacturer, which we see a lot of. Um, you know, there's the whole Austin and then there's the whole Owen controversy in which you have this essentially an Australian private who comes up with a submachine gun design much more efficient and easier to produce than the Austin or the Australian Sten. And you have that whole thing play out. And then you also have a couple of other submachine gun designs called the Kokoda, named after the Kokoda Trail, in which you have some issues with it during production and you have some issues with it in trials. A cool fact about Australian small arms is that Australia is one of the only countries in the Second World War to really go to extreme lengths to camouflage some of their small arms. We see this with the Austin, we see this with the Owen, we see this with the Kokoda, and the museum in Lithgow actually has examples of these in, in which you actually have a finish applied to these submachine guns to try to camouflage them in the, in the jungles of the Pacific Theater where a lot of Australian forces were operating in the Second World War. And so anyway, Second World War ends and Lithgow throughs another period of toning down and you have a lot of the factory force leaving from the factory because the war's over. Things start picking up again during the Vietnam War because if we recall, Australia was one of the biggest contributors of troops of the Commonwealth countries to the Vietnam War. You actually have a lot of Australian contingents that are fighting there. This coincides with the SLR production in which Lithgow actually picks up SLR production of the FNFAL. A cool side note about the SLR is that during the Vietnam War, a number of Australian units developed a TTP in which unit armors would actually file off portions of the fire control group 
and then they'd turn the semi-automatic rifles into fully automatic only rifles. They'd have extra long magazines that were intended for the SLR LMG variant, and then they'd chop the barrel down as well, so the muzzle would be a lot shorter to the front sight post. These rifles were colloquially called the bitch, and the idea for these rifles was to give them to the point man on infantry patrols in Vietnam. And the point of that was so if one of these Australian patrols were to take contact in the jungle, especially at close range, the plan was for that point man to unload his entire magazine at the source of enemy contact. And then that would allow the patrol to be able to have a fighting withdrawal out of that contact zone. And the idea of this bitch was to extensuate the muzzle flash, have as many rounds as possible with the extended magazine and on full automatic capability, and to make the enemy think that they were getting shot at with a lot more than they actually were. So ironically, all these modifications were sort of done at the unit armor level, and none of these originated from Lithgow itself. You have these rifles that are modified against regulations, and then you have them from units that are in country, and a lot of these units are swapping rifles out between the next unit coming in. And those units are taking those rifles and then using them and they're swapping them out with the next unit that comes in. And none of these have actually sort of reached the rear echelon part of design in which they aren't factory driven or they aren't driven from higher, even though this is a critical need at the front done by troops who see this as a valid point. So now we sort of get to the 1980s. And in the 1980s, the Australian government goes through a massive program of decentralizing production, of trying to thin down government capabilities. This is what the United States went through in the 1960s with Springfield Armory and a number of other government arsenals at that time. So the same thing happened in Australia. Uh, in the 1980s, you have the Australian government looking at ways they can thin down. And Lithgow Small Arms Factory is one of the unfortunate government entities that is cut. This is actually a blow that the people of Lithgow haven't since recovered from, partly because a lot of them actually lost their jobs, and also because the resulting company that came into place, uh, ADI, or Australian Defense Industries, took over, and a lot of people to this day still think that ADI was horribly mismanaged, it didn't do as an efficient job as before, and ADI was this sort of semi-corporate, semi-government entity that took over, and they didn't just do stuff at Lithgow, they also produced vehicles, they also produced a whole lot of other defense instruments in use by the Australian defense industry and by the Australian armed forces. As a caveat to ADI, before ADI and when Lithgow was still in operation, it's interesting to note that Lithgow actually did produce a lot of other stuff besides small arms. They produced tracks for various tracked vehicles, they produced accessories. So ADI takes over in 1989, but before that we have trials of the Steyr AUG in Australian military service. AUG is accepted into Australian military service as the F-88 and ADI takes over in 89 and produces the F-88 until ADI itself sort of goes under. Good riddance, there has to be something better out there. So along this design timeline, you have the F-88 and you have a number of different variants and derivatives that are produced to include a 22 long rifle training variant, to include a number of different barrel lengths for carbines and rifle lengths, some with grenade launchers outfitted and etc. Um, the next variant that we see in that line is the EF-88 or the enhanced F-88. And the EF-88 continues use with Australia today. On the flip side of things with the EF-88, you have the F-90. Anyways, thanks guys. Hope you enjoyed the episode and thank you for watching. 